It is a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Sally Ghazal. Sally is a registered psychotherapist with the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario. She obtained her master's degree in clinical psychology from University of Indianapolis, USA. Sally has worked in private practices in the Middle East since 2005 and in Canada since 2015. Majority of her work is adult and young adults and are dealing with anxiety, phobia, depression, stress, and trauma. She believes in empowering clients by allowing them to set their goals, explore their options, and use coping techniques while providing to support uncomfortable environment for them to do so. Sally has also been conducting many educational sessions over the past four years for educators, parents, women, and newcomers with a particular focus on Arab community. Today, Sally will speak about acceptance and self-compassion. Welcome, Sally Ghazal. Thank you, Hanan. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, today, as uh, you mentioned, we will be talking about self-compassion and uh, self-care and acceptance. So I'm going to share my presentation with you. And um, we will just talk about how mental health affects us all. Initially, mental health is defined as a state of overall well-being, which means that our physical aspects uh, of well-being is something that we look after, but we also a lot of times neglect or overlook the, the emotional aspect of our well-being. Um, it's a state of well-being. Uh, according to the World Health Organization, we define mental health as a state of well-being in which we are all able to achieve our full potential. And in order to do so, we must pay attention to some minor details that sometimes we overlook, such as self-compassion. So if we go back to the idea of what compassion is initially, when we talk about compassion, it's this warm feeling. When I think of the word compassion, I think of warmth, I think of love, support, acceptance. And we're usually very good at doing that, especially uh, those of us in the healthcare field, those of us who look after people, we're very good at being empathetic and compassionate with others. The question here is, are we good doing with with that, uh, you know, for ourselves, are we good self compassion? Um, so we can look at the definitions here. So some of the misconceptions about compassion, we think it's a form of self pity, we say that when I'm compassionate, it makes me weak, it makes me feel bad for myself, it makes me feel sorry for myself. Uh, some people might say that it makes me complacent, and I don't try to progress, or I just kind of give myself excuses for everything I do. Or it's a narcissistic and a form of being selfish and uh, putting myself first. None of this is true. Self-compassion is something that we all need to do in order to enable ourselves or to, to better ourselves and in order for us to be able to do better for not just ourselves, but for people around us. So compassion in itself is noticing when some other people are suffering feeling a desire to help them. And as a result of that feeling like we are moved and we're able to do something for them, start by understanding where they're going, where they're coming from, sorry, and being kind towards them. And then as we realize that suffering is part of the shared human experience, we are compelled to do something to support or to help. And sometimes, you know, we might uh, see someone on the street you know, in Toronto, it might be common if you're walking down the street to see a homeless person, you are moved by their experience, you feel something for them, you might want to do something to support them, or you might just uh, experience that empathy. If we were to translate that or to transfer that from feeling towards other people to feeling towards ourselves, it looks exactly the same. We need to notice our own suffering. We need to feel like we need to make a change but in order to do that we also have to accept that we are going through this and we have to kind of sit with that feeling rather than trying to uh, repress it or ignore it or avoid it so having the same response to yourself to your own suffering as you would do towards others what are some ways that we become we can practice to become more compassionate with ourselves 
The first one, which is uh, something I tell my clients all the time when they're using critical judgmental words to describe themselves or to describe an experience that they've had. And I ask, would you tell that to a friend? Would you say that to a friend? And most of the time the answer is no. Actually, I would say 100% of the time the answer is no. So take a minute and think about how am I treating myself and would I treat myself? Would I treat someone I love the way I'm treating myself? Uh, taking uh, self-compassion breaks, stopping for a minute and saying, I'm being too hard on myself. The task that I'm expecting to complete, what I'm telling myself I should have done uh, yesterday was unachievable. It was difficult. I was just having an off day. It's okay that I didn't manage to do this, whatever it was, rather than uh, just constantly pushing ourselves and not taking that moment. And maybe when I'm taking that self-compassion break, that's where I practice some self-care which is something that we will spend a few minutes talking about in, in a bit. Uh, writing a letter from a friend, it's, it's an exercise that I've actually found helpful and very interesting. Imagine if I'm writing myself a letter and that letter is coming from somebody who loves me. What would I say to myself? Because we need to hear these words of encouragement sometimes. Um, the chair exercise is something that we do sometimes in therapy where I would you know, role play, imagine that this person is sitting in front of me in a chair, what would I say to them? And this person is myself, right? So if I'm sitting there on the chair across, would I be saying such harsh words if I have failed or if I have not met a certain expectation? And then focusing on the self-talk is something that will help us develop a compassion. Most of the therapy that we do with the cognitive behavioral therapy is one approach. A lot of the therapy focuses on what we're saying to ourselves. The idea here is if I interpret a situation in a negative way, if I tell myself things that are not necessarily uh, realistic, uh, not necessarily positive, it's going to lead to very negative emotion towards that. So for example, if I have uh, missed a deadline, let's say, and the self-talk is, you're such a failure, you always miss deadlines, you're not going to get anywhere in life, what are the feelings that are going to come out of that? Uh, and that's going to be very harsh and very negative, and it's going to eventually lead to heightened anxieties, depressions, uh, other forms of uh, mental health issues. So rather we just take a minute and say, what am I saying to myself? I'm a failure or is there some more, is there another way to look at it? Um, you know, I failed this time because I had um, another commitment. Something was going on personally. I have failed this time, but I have passed in, in many other situations. I have done well in other places, but I have failed this time. This is more realistic and it sits differently with us. Motivating ourselves in new ways. So we might be used to the idea of uh, that negative self-talk to motivate us. If I keep telling myself I'm not good enough, I'm gonna work harder, I'm gonna try better, I'm gonna uh, do more. The reality is we need to find different ways to motivate ourselves. Can I encourage myself? Can I say, it's okay to take a break? It's okay to uh, not necessarily uh, meet all these expectations right here, right now. Again, as I'm saying this, it might sound like I'm saying, yeah, we should just give up on ourselves. And that's not the idea. It's, it's just the idea of loving ourselves. When I tell my child who did not do very well in school, uh, it's okay that you didn't do well this time, you'll do better next time. I'm not saying that I'm okay or you should be okay with not achieving. I'm just saying that you should take a moment to, to accept that about yourself, to love yourself and to work towards a change. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about acceptance. Let's move on to what self-care looks like. I'm sorry, before we do that, we're gonna talk a bit about uh, more aspects of uh, self-compassion, which is being mindful. So if I stop for a minute and I reflect on my thoughts, I understand them, kind of like what we were saying earlier, uh, saying that the more I say this to myself, the more likely I'm going to have a negative reaction to it. And then allowing our feelings. 
something that we don't really do when we're not being compassionate is we do not accept feelings, uh, negative feelings. We do not express them. So people might feel certain ways about themselves, about the world, about whatever is happening, but they keep it to themselves. This is when we are repressing emotions. And there are so many things that come out as a result of that. Uh, anxiety being one of the main issues that we encounter regularly in our practice. I see people who are experiencing anxiety daily. And a big part of it is, I don't wanna deal with these feelings. I'm gonna keep them in. Um, and you know, it could get to an extreme place where we're experiencing PTSD or other forms of mental health issues just because we are suppressing feelings and we're not allowing them out. So allow these feelings to be expressed, share them in a positive setting, uh, even if it's as simple as keeping a journal of your feelings, if you don't want to share them with people, you can write them down. One exercise I do with my clients is I just have them write down all these negative feelings and thoughts and then rip that paper. You don't even have to see it. Nobody has to see it, but just let it out, express it. Um, as we're doing so, though, we have to be careful not to allow these feelings to completely take over. So it's, it's not one of the two extremes. It's either I'm not expressive at all or I'm over expressive and I'm constantly living in that state of sadness or anger just finding that balance and always being aware when we're being compassionate to ourselves that this is humanity right so it, common humanity is we all suffer we all have a negative self-talk we all have failed at some point i'm not the only one something that we hear very commonly uh, when people are being hard on themselves is i'm the only one who failed i'm the only one who's not good enough we hear it growing up sometimes. Parents might use that to encourage their kids. How come you're the only one who hasn't done such and such? So remember that this is a common human experience. We all experience it at some point. So practicing kindness rather than judgment is what's important here. Understanding that there is some sort of pain or misfortune or a mistake accepting it as our own mistake, as something, accepting responsibility for it, and then using words of encouragement and empathy, which looks very different from judgment when we're either ignoring, criticizing, and using critical judgmental language. So as I said earlier, self-care is a very important part of compassion. And when we hear self-care, a lot of us think, uh, it means I need to pamper myself, go to a spa, or do something excessive, and that's not the idea. The idea of self-care does not necessarily mean going on vacation and uh, doing something elaborate, but it's very small steps that we can do daily. We just incorporate things that are healthy for us that maintain our mental and physical health. So the first step to self-care is physical self-care having good sleep habits, making sure that you're getting enough rest, making sure that you're eating well, uh, you're eating things that are good for you, exercising regularly. And a lot of times I hear it from people, I don't have time to work out. I'm too busy with my life. I don't have time to exercise. We can find a way to put it in our daily routine. One thing that helped me personally was when I said, even though I don't have time, I deserve this. It's good for me. It's something I deserve. It's something that I should do for me. So just like I'm making time for everybody else, just like I'm making time for everything else, the half hour a day that I'm making for myself to exercise is what I owe myself. I deserve this. And that kind of created a shift in my mind. Social self-care. Um, this is something that we noticed during COVID how the lack of socializing, how not having enough people around us, how not having the support system really affected our mental health. So our self-care, my personal self-care definitely includes having people around me. If I'm disconnected from people for a long period of time, such as what happened during the pandemic, we tend to feel that sense of isolation. We tend to feel a bit of sadness. We might have uh, many different emotions. 
So a big part of self-care is making sure that I'm working on my existing relationships, I'm building new relationships, I'm expanding uh, these connections. Mental self-care, very similar to what we talked about, what I talked about a little bit ago, paying attention to that inner dialogue. What am I saying to myself? Making sure that I start using that shift um, in a similar way to what I was just saying about how I motivated myself to exercise was saying, I deserve this. This is good for me. Um, rather than the words of, uh, no, I have too much work. I don't have time to do this. It's not important. Listening to my dialogue and shifting it so it's healthier. And then engaging in mentally stimulating activities. A lot of times we end up um, in avoidance patterns, and we'll talk a bit more about that, where basically I just, after a long day of work, I just want to sit on my phone and be on social media. And that's not a mentally stimulating activity. I understand that that's a way to switch off sometimes. That's a way to just take a break from everything. And it makes sense that we may need that mental break, but also engaging in mentally stimulating activities like uh, doing um, the simple things like a crossword puzzle, or I like Sudoku, it's the numbers game. Anything where I'm engaging my mind as well, that's taking care of my mental um, parts. Spiritual self-care. And it doesn't mean that I have to be practicing a specific uh, form of spirituality or religion, but just reflecting, sitting with myself and thinking about what am I doing here? Where am I going from here? What's next? How is it gonna, how am I gonna progress as a human? as you know, that, that spiritual aspect of it. And if engaging in spiritually fulfilling practices is something that's uh, uh, available or able, you're able to do that, that's great. You could also, that's part of self-care. The last part of self-care or aspect of self-care is the emotional self-care. So acknowledging our feelings rather than blocking our feelings. And that's very, very important. Again, suppression and blocking is gonna lead to uh, a lot of consequences that we don't want to get to. So just sitting with that feeling, acknowledging it, developing healthy coping strategies, uh, taking some time for the self and engaging in activities to help you recharge. As we're doing that, we're, we're going, if we go back to this, acknowledging the feeling, we need to be very careful with what it means when we're resisting our feelings. So as I said, dismissing the feeling or resisting it is gonna lead to uh, experiencing anger, frustration, not being able to cope. So anytime we're encountering a negative emotion, our go-to, our default usually is, I don't wanna think about it. We even hear this growing up, a child goes up to a parent and says, I'm scared. And the parent says, don't think about it, you'll be fine. And the reality is that's not true. If I don't think about it, it's going to get worse. It's going to make me more scared. It's going to lead to anxiety. What we need to do is we have to accept that I am scared. I need to sit with that feeling and I need to figure out what do I do about it? What are some ways to cope with feeling scared? what's next for me so by accepting that that's that's really the ultimate meaning and i know that we don't have enough time to go into different types of acceptance but if we were to take the core meaning of acceptance here it's just accepting that this is happening at this moment and that there are ways to deal with it so it's not the same as resignation it's not saying uh it's okay you know i'm scared it's okay to be scared i'm always going to be scared that's fine no, that's not the idea. I'm scared at this moment. I need to sit with that feeling. I need to accept that it's happening to me. And I need to see what am I going to do about it. So Carl Rogers, who is one of the founders of the humanistic psychology, said, when I accept myself just as I am, then I can change. It's not the idea is not not to change. It's taking it in so I can do the necessary steps to change. 
So first we have to become aware of our own resistance. So if I'm scared and I'm just, sorry, if I'm scared and I'm not paying attention to it, if I am not really aware that I'm just ignoring that feeling, then I'm not gonna get anywhere. I have to reflect on patterns. So what happens when I'm worried about a deadline at work, I end up procrastinating. I end up uh, going on my phone and doing things that I don't really need to be doing. I'm on social media. So that's a pattern. Then becoming mindful of that behavior. If that's my pattern, then what am I doing? I'm usually just doing that until the last minute. I've become a procrastinator. Start listening to what I tell myself. I say things like, I'm always going to be a procrastinator. I'm not good enough. I'm not going to succeed in this. And then we start working towards shifting. I'm going to practice acceptance in my daily language. I'm going to shift what I say to myself to say it in a different way. I think that's the time we have for today. I hope this has been useful and uh, best of luck. Thank you very much.